Sorry, I'm recording on the cloud this time. Uh, nice. So cloud is good. The purpose of this meeting is kind of twofold. The one um, one branch, let's say, is uh, for me to kind of get a better understanding of the users. Uh, I think maybe primarily we should focus on orchestration features, but then if uh, we feel we have some time, kind of span towards the system um, side of things. So, and the second purpose is to come up with jobs to be done for me to do UX scorecards for, uh, which was the experience baseline that now has been renamed to UX scorecards. Okay. And uh, these, uh, well, excluding Tori's uh, task, which was creating and adding an EKA, EKS cluster. Um, okay, can, excluding that, that task? Excluding because it's in the roadmap already to rescore that, but we're kind of waiting for uh, the work to finish. Um, Okay. From, from that side. So my idea was maybe uh, to combine these two would be nice for you to put multiple hats on, kind of a dev hat on, our personas hats on, basically, and um, narrate it as a story, like as a user, let's say Devon, who is a dev persona. Uh, I'm working on a project that has kind of these requirements, and I come to GitLab to do this and this and that. And maybe it doesn't only have to be restricted on the DevOps side, because I, as a new starter, kind of have fresh eyes. I'm not going to land for the UX score, scoring necessarily on um, the um, Kubernetes side or on kind of the configuring side of things, but I will start maybe from the home page of a project and try to navigate. Uh, because I realized I was trying to go to the admin area uh, and I couldn't find the admin area like on a separate task and then I was trying to uh, find the DNS. So there are a lot of uh, configuration that's in separate areas of the system and I would like to include that in my scoring. So, so the idea is you can say as Devon, like as a dev, I'm doing this and that and I'm going to do this job. And then we can split, we can document the jobs to create the UX cards for. But also, I can get a better understanding of which persona comes to which area uh, to do what. How does that sound? Okay. That sounds great. So, users and jobs to be done. Got it. Um, what, so, one question I have about the scorecards is I, I noticed that Tori did that um, um, creating an EKS cluster flow. But that all happens outside of GitLab. So this scorecards are just anything that the user has to do, even if it's within or outside of GitLab, is that right? That's right, yeah. So uh, it's to complete the task, no matter if it, we have the functionality or not. So um, okay. yeah. the purpose yep. is to score current uh, experience. And as Tori's, in Tori's example, for example, we realized it would be better to integrate the creation as we do for uh, Google uh, platform. Uh, to do the same for AWS, so that okay. it's smoother uh, and faster, I guess. Okay. But in my case, I'm not sure I'm going to... Uh, depends on our discussion today. Sorry, let me turn on the light because it's a bit dark. Um, so maybe let's start with the most simple ones, most simple tasks, and then go into the more... Uh, okay. So do you want to start with that or do you want to start with users? Where, where do we want to start? Maybe combine. So let's wear the hat of the whatever persona is our primary. I guess that would be an ops person or a dev person. Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. So let's start with uh, auto DevOps. So auto DevOps is, as you know, a CI template that basically aims to provide you best practices in the box. So everybody wants to have an advanced DevOps workflow. Everybody wants to have security built in. Everybody wants to have uh, the license scanning built in. But creating a pipeline that has all of those features is hard, right? So we have a bunch of templates that you could use separately, uh, but Auto DevOps is this one-stop shop that aims to provide that. Okay, I'm gonna stop you here. Maybe we should start by, I am Devon and I'm working on a project. Uh, maybe use 
draw from your customer uh, conversations or a hypothetical scenario. And you can explain what you're working on and why would you come to Auto DevOps for not. So I don't want us to see what we offer as GitLab, but what the need of the user is that drove okay. to come to us. And maybe okay. we can host this functionality that is needed by him. But um, so what, what's the job he came to do? And so as a software developer, I want to build uh, a modern DevOps workflow for my project. Um, yeah, that's, I would say, the main job. So I want and to know I, what does the modern include? So modern basically includes all the cloud native best practices that uh, are popular in the world today. That means uh, everything shifts left. And what that means is that you don't wait until your project is built to do all the things you need to do, but you do them as part of your project. So in the past, we would do security scanning after you know we, we have a, a compiled um, artifact that we're gonna ship to users. We would wait to do security then. Now that has all shifted in what the, the movement is called shift left. And what it means is that you're not waiting until it's done, you're building all of those processes as part of your pipeline. So uh, security is a big one, uh, but just like security, you have things like license scanning, uh, container scanning, all of those things are basically being built in. So as a user, I want to, um, have modern DevOps practices as part of my project. And of course, like, I don't know where to start. I could build a pipeline that builds it and I could build another one that, that deploys it, but that's it. Like I wouldn't know where, like where to start for all the other stuff. So is your company progressive, which means they have adopted all the DevOps uh, or DevOps in general, or are you experimenting with a pet project on convincing your company to, um, Adopt. I think that we assume that um, we have a bit of both, but a lot of the people that want to use auto DevOps are beginning their journey to modern DevOps practices. Right. So maybe it's a pet project you have and you want to share it with your team after. It, it could be like uh, we, we see a lot of people that start with internal stuff. So let's say I have a project that is a portal that is uh, accessed only by internal users. So there's a little bit more um, like headway to make, make mistakes because, uh, like if it happens, it only uh, affects your internal group. Uh, so a lot of people will start there or a lot of people will, will, will start with a replica or of one of their production projects. Okay. Which of the two examples would you like to take? Let's take one of the two examples of, uh, in our user story that I'm working on a internal project or a replica project. Um, we can use internal project. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, cool. Okay, so you have been working on your code using GitLab or using something else? Let's say GitLab. Yeah, you you are a, a GitLab user. Um, I guess one of the possible scenarios is that you switch to GitLab so you could use features like auto DevOps. So that that's also a possibility. But I think for the sake of East, let's just say, yeah, I'm an, I'm an existing GitLab. So you, you already have um, files that include your uh, code? Yeah, let's say yes. So describe me your GitLab environment, uh, please. You have a project? I have a, uh, a project, uh, let's say, on a self managed GitLab instance that is managed by my company. Um, and I have a project there that um, I want to build this pipeline for. How big is your project? In terms of megabytes or in terms of uh, files? In terms of files and functionality. So is it um, part of a project, like continuous integration and delivery, or is it a bigger? Um, so I, I, I think that, um, we should assume that continuous integration and continuous delivery are part of every project, regardless of size. But I'm going to say that this is, uh, let's say, a small project. Okay. Okay, so you have your code and now it's the job to be done, I guess. 
What's the job you want to do? I want to build a modern DevOps. Or I, I want to build a CI pipeline that includes or that uses modern DevOps practices. Okay. Any, do you have your own requirements for your pipeline or? Um... Yes, I generally know what I want. And uh, I think at the top of mind, I have, um, I want to scan all my dependencies to make sure that nothing is vulnerable uh, from, from a security standpoint. I want to scan all of the containers that are uh, included in my project to make sure that there is no vulnerabilities there. Um, and I want to do, uh, like keeping with the theme of security, I want to do uh, dynamic um, application security testing and static application security testing. Dynamic and static, okay. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I also want to test uh, the quality of my code. So I guess that uh, we could summarize that as security and quality. I want to build that into my, my, my pipeline. I want that to be part of my pipeline. Uh, another thing is that I want my pipeline. Sorry, security and quality, right? Security and quality. So that would be uh, encompassed by SAST, DAST, dependency scanning, and container scanning. Those are the four main things that come to mind when we think about security. So these are common uh, things developers test in any environment. That in the need. world, out there. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the good ones too. Which is SAST and DAST. Yes. Any other? So dependency, dependency? Dependency, yeah. Uh, de uh, dependency scanning and container scanning were the other two that I mentioned. Okay. So these are the common things somebody wants to include in their testing. Uh, okay. In their pipeline, yes. It's part of their pipeline. So do we have more to say on this job to be done or shall I um, summarize? To move to um, well, so as part of my pipeline, I think I also would like to see my project running live on a pre-production environment, so that I can um, so that I can test it and share it with others. So that's another job to be done, I guess, or could it? Be well, that's part of building my 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 pipeline. As part of my pipeline, I want to build that in. So we build that in as part of review apps, but new users or existing users may call it different things, but we call them review apps. So we say, I want to build a review app as part of my pipeline. Um, re okay, maybe we can phrase them later. I'm just taking a note that uh, on how you previously said it, I want to see my projects run in a pre-production environment. Sure. Okay. Environment. So, okay, that job to be done will be, I think, yeah, we need to rephrase it because it has two parts. The one is I want to build a pipeline that uh, includes security testing and container scanning and, well, common practice testing, I guess. And also I would say that, that, um, that would be encompassed in the first job that we mentioned, which is I want to build a pipeline that includes modern DevOps practices. Okay. That's the job to be done. So that's one. And, then, and that job, of course, has like many things inside of it. Yeah. Yeah. So the second one is I also want to see as part of my pipeline a pre-production environment. Um, yeah, that's that's included in that first big one. So part of having a modern DevOps pipeline is that you automatically have your project running in a, an environment where you can poke it and test it and stuff like that. That's not production. So that's part of the modern DevOps pipeline. But yeah, that's also a sub job I would want to do. Yeah, I'll read how we do the scorecards, uh, how big we can be or how small, but yeah. Okay, great. So that's Devon, the developer. Any other stories for Devon that you can think? 
run on the ones? Uh, around, or around any of the categories? Orchestration features, let's say. Uh, or um, configure depends. features. So, so the Kubernetes management feature has more to do with operators, but developers are the ones deploying to Kubernetes. So the operator is the one setting up that infrastructure, but developers are the one that have to write the manifests that will deploy to Kubernetes. So another job to be done would be as a developer, um, I want to build a pipeline that deploys my project to a Kubernetes cluster. Um, that's very broad though. And I, I guess that that has to do more with CI uh, than our Kubernetes integration. So our Kubernetes integration is not doing that for you. You have to do that today. So maybe that's better for auto DevOps. So, so as a developer, I want to build a pipeline that deploys my project to Kubernetes cluster using an automated. Uh, <laughs> no, you know what? That's more. That's more of a CI job to be done. I, I I don't think that we should include that one. For um, I was thinking, what jobs we want to include for Kubernetes management? Um, there are plenty. But let's say one of them is um, as a developer, I want to see. Uh, the number, oh no, I want to see the pods associated with my Kubernetes deployment. That's a more clear one, not as overly broad. Um, so is it a developer or um, operation? That's a developer. a developer. That's a developer. And why would a developer uh, want to see the pods that are related with, associated with, with his project? Well, so let's say that uh, there, there, there's a number of, of reasons, but the, I, I would say that the main one is that if you set your replicas for your deployment at a certain number, you want to make sure that the correct number was deployed. So if I say my, my replicas is, let's say, 20, I want to make sure that 20 were deployed. Uh, that's number one. And number two is that you also want to see the state of your pods. So you want to make sure that, that, that they're healthy. Um, and then... Once you have the pods, if you're, let's say, troubleshooting an issue or trying to uncover some behavior or the, the root cause for some, some behavior, you'll want to look at the logs for your pod. Uh, so those are kind of the three main reasons why you would want to see them. But um, yeah. OK, thank you. So um, I, I, I guess, like, yeah, those are kind of three jobs to be done within that the seeing the pods one is like I, I want to see the number of pods to make sure that my configuration is, is, is correct another one would be I want to access the logs uh, for a particular pod while I'm troubleshooting an issue um, and another one would be I want to ensure that my pods are healthy so those are kind of three di uh, distinct jobs that I could think of um, would uh Somebody could do them just uh, one by one or all three together as part of a task. So, yeah, you generally do it one by one. Yeah, you generally would do this one by one. But, yeah, okay. That's sorry. I was trying to start designing now, but I'll stop <laughs> and go back to jobs to be done. Okay. Yeah, so so we, we, and in product, we have the same problem where we go straight to solving a, a, a problem. Yeah. So it's good to step back and try to understand the problem um, and whether all three are connected in one, so would, they would benefit from one feature, but yeah, trying not to design. Okay, so now we have four jobs to be done. So I want to build a modern um, an application with modern DevOps uh, practices, then... A pipeline, yes. <laughs> pipeline. Um, then I want to uh, check the number of replicas that were created. Um, well, that's the pods. So the we pod. said, I, uh, I, I want to see the pods uh, for my Kubernetes deployment. Yeah. And then I want to see the health of the pods. And then I want to see the logs for uh, the pods. Okay. Yes. Any other jobs for the developer or? 
Oh yeah, I, I can think of plenty. Yeah, how 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 many are we looking for? Um, and that's that's just among two categories. So we we haven't moved on from auto DevOps and Kubernetes configuration. So if we move on to chaos engineering, um, you would say as a developer, uh, I want to ensure that my application is resilient and can withstand um, outages, like unplanned outages. Resilient, sorry, I'm a bit slow. I should be typing actually, but I'm um, used to. Ah, I but I was wondering why, why, but it seems that you prefer to take notes with pen and paper. That's great. Yeah, I do. Usually when we use our interviews, I much prefer that uh, because I cannot blind type. So, uh, but I can blind write sometimes. <laughs> okay. Um, no, there's this this connection that we lose when you write out something with your hands. I think that uh, it'll remain in your brain for longer. Uh, yeah, there's just this neat thing about writing that I like. Yeah. And, but you don't see a lot of a, a lot of people doing it. Like I do it very seldom, just because I can type a lot faster than I can write. So. Okay. But when then you go back to in writing, at least my handwriting after a long period I hadn't written was so bad uh, that I was like, oh my God, I f forgot how to write. <laughs> but it comes back. Um, okay, so as a developer, I want to ensure that my application is resilient and can handle uh, any shortages. Unknown, unplanned outages. Outages, unplanned outages. Um, just for my benefit, is do we have functionality for chaos engineering? I remember we are building it now. We're building it now. So, yes. So twelve five, we'll see the MVC for chaos engineering. So I guess that's a job to be done uh, that can wait uh, until. Sure. Or otherwise. So should we focus only then on features that are on uh, part of the product today? In all honesty. Just as a philosophical conversation. <laughs> we know that what we don't support is going to be trickier for the user to do because they have to change the environment, they have to get out of the club, they have to log in somewhere else. So we kind of know beforehand that the experience is not going to be good. So the philosophical conversation is why would I score this experience if we don't offer the functionality yet? Um, okay. That's fair. I'm down with that. But yeah, if you, so I'd rather rate score the first user experience since I'm also new. And also, I don't think there is any work in GitLab taking care of onboarding a user in GitLab, not just orchestration, but anywhere. There are dots. I mean, yeah. So what, what um, do you picture that a new user would not need to reference like any documentation to carry out a job? Well, ideally that's my job, but I'm trying to be realistic, but I don't want to jump to docs to do any small task. Okay. I want to be the navigation, information architecture be into Yeah, that's, that's reasonable. So when you qualify it like that and you say small task, I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. But in my mind, it would be unrealistic to think that um, a software development tool would need no reference to anything uh, because that's kind of the first things that software developers do when they use a new tool is read the documents. Uh, I and I think that that's a very common thing because um, like with GitLab CI, let's say, there are so many features that you can use um, and all you have in GitLab CI is a text editor. So you have to write by hand all of the things you want to do. Um, there's like not autocomplete, there's nothing. so without reading documentation, you can't really do anything. I agree. Uh, and that's in the world of CI, right? But um, Yeah, but CI is uh, a step before us, right? So mm -hmm. if a user gets frustrated by yes. CI, they're never gonna make it to us because they're gonna give up uh, using GitLab. Um, well, that's um, not necessarily true because if you're using a feature like Auto DevOps, you don't need to worry about, um, about writing any CI. Yeah. Auto DevOps is the CI. 
So you can just import your files and just use Auto DevOps. Yeah, when you have a project, then you have a tile right there that says enable Auto DevOps or add a, add a cluster, things like that. And you never have to CCI unless you come to a point in your journey where you have to do something more specialized. So to your previous point, documentation obviously in our case is going to be needed and used, but not to navigate and find things uh, in the interface or in the middle of a job sure. already know. Uh, that's reasonable. So that's yeah where I'm coming from. Okay, so okay. Um, I will document the jobs and then we can prioritize based on whether we have functionality and um, how important. So, okay. So as a developer, I want to ensure that my application is resilient and can handle any unplanned outages. That's another job to be done. And that's- Yeah, so that. that's, since that's part of chaos engineering, I had a couple of other jobs to be done for that uh, category in mind, but maybe we should move on since, that, since that's functionality that we don't have today. Uh, sure, and then we can finish by just uh, documenting them for the future, maybe. I mean, oh, at the okay. end. Yeah. We so, well, or well, no. so we, we, we should keep talking about it then since it's fresh. Do you mind that we do that? No. no. Um, so another job is that as a developer, I want to configure the boundaries for the chaos that I'm going to inflict in my application. The boundaries are how much damage is going to happen. Just for yeah, like mind. how how uh, yeah, how much damage do you want to uh, inflict? Is a good way of putting it. Yeah. So as I want to configure the boundaries or slash how much damage I want to inflict to my environment. Or how much chaos? Yeah. That's how you generally reference this: like how much chaos I want to inflict. Okay. And that's again a dev, right? They want to see how their code behaves. Uh, yes, yes. So you want to start small and then you want to build up, yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's fine for, It's fine for chaos engineering. Let's move on to the next category. So cluster cost optimization is another category that we have planned, mm -hmm. but we have not started work on yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but th that's more for an operator. So I guess there's not so much for a developer. Okay. If it's um, from the operator side in mind, but yeah, maybe it would be good to keep them structured. Uh, developer okay. first and then operator. But if you're done with the developer also, you can. Uh... Well, so I'm done with orchestration. Uh, do you want to talk about system or do you, would, would you rather do that with, with Victor? He has already provided some jobs to be done. Um, not jobs to be done, some user stories. I'm just thinking uh, for serverless, there is just a native installation or are there more features? Uh, well, so for serverless, if you are a Kubernetes user, you want to deploy serverless workloads to, to Kubernetes. But there are other platforms that our users deploy to today uh, such as uh, Lambda, such as GCP Cloud Functions and stuff like that. And those are all jobs that are happening today. So they're yeah. basically um, putting their code in a GitLab project. They are building a CI pipeline that will deploy it out there to AWS or Google. And uh, basically that's part of serverless, right? They're doing like functions as a service and things like that. So that's part um, of their code rather than the use of specific GitLab features. Is that what you mean? That they write their code in functions instead of uh, whatever, um, like? Yeah, it's true. It's more of a, um, yeah, code and CI job uh, when it's not Knative. Uh, so with Knative, then yes, it's very involved with GitLab features. Without it, it's not as much. Okay. Well, we can document uh, with you, and then I can speak to Victor as well about. Um, 
the jobs to be done on, on this side. So we can, because you're more experienced, you have been here for longer. I think okay. your insight is very valuable. So we're still on the dev persona, even though mm -hmm. my internet connection is a stable, I'm warning you as I was warned. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. By Zoom. Uh, okay, so the primary persona in my understanding for serverless is a developer because serverless is supposed to take the operations configuration out of the operator and into the code. Right? Absolutely, that, that is true. The primary target persona is a developer. So as a developer, um, I want to um, focus on just writing my application code and not have to learn how to set up uh, infrastructure to, to deploy it. So that's the main advantage of serverless. Another one is cost, but I would say cost is more on the operator side. Um, but as a developer, I want my code to just work, right? I want my code to automatically scale based on load. Um, I want uh, um, like the necessary resources to be allocated based on what I'm deploying without me having to do anything. I just want that to happen automatically. Okay. Um, so the job is that as a developer, I want to deploy my code without uh, dealing with the infrastructure configuration. Is that a fair? Yep. That's fair. The um, parentheses, they can include configuration of infrastructure in their code, right? If they want to, or is that? As part of your CI pipeline, uh, not uh, not as much as part of your code, but as, as, as part of your CI pipeline, you can include the, the configuration of your infrastructure. Um, because I was reading on the vision and infra infrastructure as service, I think, is that? As code. As code, yeah. that's in serverless, uh, in system. In system, that's right. Okay, but that's a separate kind of. Separate conversation, yeah. Okay. So, so the main advantage of serverless is that, yeah, I don't have to set up, I don't have to think about how many machines, how many servers, how much memory, how much power, how much storage. I don't have to think about any of that because the provider is doing that for me. Yeah. Um, it's basically abstracting all of that configuration and I just deploy my code and I just worry about writing good code instead of having to deal with all that. Cool. So that's one. As a developer, I want to focus on just deploying my code without worrying about infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Without, yeah, without having to configure infrastructure, without having to worry about how to configure uh, infrastructure. I think I lost you. Let's see. Now? Hey, you're back. Okay. It was correct that my internet is unstable. <laughs> okay. But so does that ha does that ha happen to you um, often or not really? I lost you again. Hello. Hey, we're back. I'm back. I'm trying to find my video because if I yeah, if I stop it, it will be better. But let's wait and see. It happens quite often the past four months, uh, but I don't know. I've called my company a million times. Sometimes it's just because I moved the modem, and I think the cable is. Yeah affected but right now i didn't move anything so i guess it's just uh the provider are you on a uh, when you say the cable are you on a wired connection or are you on a wi-fi connection so my laptop is on a wi-fi but the cable, the modem is connected to the uh, outside world so yeah it, it could have to do with uh like a lot of rf noise where you live if you have a lot of neighbors that are using the same bands and stuff like that 
I think it's that. I used to have that problem on my last place and uh, I used a wired connection because it, it just made life so, so much easier. But yeah, I, I never have that problem with you. Your, your connection is very stable. I used to have that problem with Victor quite a bit, but he, I guess, improved his, his connection speed. I think I lost you again. Yeah, see, not as stable. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I, so last night my internet died uh, for a while. Maybe they're doing works or something, but I will call them and complain again. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I just saw your picture and boy, your hair was so long. You cut it quite a bit. I lost you again. Maybe we should both stop video so your bandwidth doesn't suffer. Maybe it will help, but can you hear me now? I can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Yeah, I was saying I donated uh, the part of, that I cut to. Really? Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, for wig, uh, for women with cancer. So. That's very noble. Very nice of you. Was I that the main uh, the main motivation, or no? I always you had just wanted short to cut it for a long time. Oh, okay. yeah, I always had short hair, and that was the longest period I had long hair. So I was like, that's very hard to maintain. Uh, I'll go back I to. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's just comfort. Good, comfort is good. Um, so can, can you hear me? I think I might've lost you. Okay, let's see how the connection is like. Oh, not again. I can hear you. I, I can, what? I could hear you there, but your voice is kind of cutting in and out. What can I do? I don't think I have many things consuming internet, but. You could connect a wire to your, to your modem. Yeah, I need to from find your the modem to your computer. I, I need to find the converter from, uh, USB to. Uh, the Ethernet. Ethernet. Yeah, yeah, and I, I know I have it somewhere, but I don't know where, so I need to. That's okay. Okay. I mean, you're, you sound fine now, so I think that you're back. And yeah, let's try. Uh, <laughs> all right. So let's talk. We were talking about serverless. Uh, so that's the first job is that I want to um, basically deploy my project without having to worry about configuring uh, infrastructure. And then within that... I would say that that's kind of the main one, but in, in GitLab, um, once you have your, well, yeah, I guess that adding a Kubernetes cluster is part of both Ku uh, Kubernetes configuration and serverless, because right now um, you would need to either add an existing cluster or create one in order to install Knative. Does that make sense? So, um... Uh, but that's yes, it does. That's I I I guess it um that job crosses across or cuts across developer and operator because if you're a developer and you want to deploy to GitLab serverless, um you'll have to add a Kubernetes cluster. So uh, it's part of the job, let's say, right? So it's it not, is part of the serverless job, yeah. Yeah. Maybe it can be a job on its own if the motivation is different. So not if you want to deploy Knative because let's say you're a new user, you're coming to GitHub, you don't know the steps you need to take to deploy to Knative, but you should be able to identify it from the uh, flow. But there is another job that I want to deploy to my cluster or I want to create a deploy to my cluster. That's part of DevOps. Well, yeah, I could imagine uh... <laughs> So uh, are we, when you say as part of DevOps, are we talking specifically about serverless or just overall? No, we're talking overall, so. I can't hear you, I think I lost you again. Can oh, you hear me now? Well, that's good. I can hear you now. Okay. I think it's going to keep going like that, unfortunately. 
Mm, I wonder. Yeah. Shall I, I, if I restart my modem, it's going to take at least five to 10 minutes. So I'm a bit hesitant. Um, yeah, we don't have to do that if you don't want to. Yeah, it's okay. I can try to find a cable. Oh, no, it's okay. Um, I think we can keep going. I mean, you, you came back. So the question that I asked is when you say you want to deploy, um, were we talking about specifically about serverless or were we talking just overall? <laughs> I can't hear you. Jeez. Oh, Master, if you want to deploy to K-Native. Uh, sorry, I wasn't hearing you. I lost you. Oh. Mm, it's becoming, I can imagine it's very frustrating for you. Um, I can imagine it's very frustrating for you as well. It is. Okay, so can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I was just saying that adding your cluster or creating a cluster, I feel like you cannot hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, I, I have no way to indicate that I'm listening, but yeah, you're right. That's yes, okay. I was listening. Yes. So creating or adding a cluster in order to uh, deploy to K native, it's part of the job already. So it's not a separate job in this case, but it could be a separate job. Is it part of? Yeah, you're right. That is, is part, part of the job. Part? I guess that installing. Um, Installing Helm, Tiller, and Knative is also part of the serverless job. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe we don't have to distill it down that much. And then everything that comes with it, like once I deploy my serverless application, mm -hmm. I want to do a number of things a lot, right? Like I want to uh, see like how much uh, capacity my application is taking up. I want to see the number of invocations that have been done to my functions. Um, I want to see maybe the cost that I'm incurring, although we don't have that today. That's coming. Um, it's okay. Uh, it's still mentioned. Yeah, so that's after you deploy, uh, you want to do all those things. You want to like take a look at the capacity. You want to take a look at the number of invocations. So that's like volume. Um, and then you want to also, yeah, I would say monitor uh, like how large your project is, is getting because you're going to be concerned with cost. Hmm. So you want to monitor the cost? I'm going to attempt to start my video and we'll see how it goes. Seems like it doesn't matter. Um, so is the intention to monitor how large the application is getting or to monitor the cost? Not the application. Uh, so the application has a fixed size that's inside your your repo. Uh, what you want to monitor is the um, how to put this. Yeah, the 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 capacity that it's using, or the number of resources that it's using. It's a better way to put that. I want to monitor the resources being used by my application because that's generally cost associated with that. So and not not only cost, right? If I if if I'm um, if I'm on a multi-tenant cluster that it's being used for multiple things, then the capacity being consumed by my app is going to affect the the neighbors that also live in that cluster. Gotcha. So if you are using the same cluster for two projects, then and one is becoming massive, then the other one might suffer a bit. And that's a very popular methodology used in in the world where you have one large cluster and then you provide like some resources of that cluster to developers so they can deploy their project so that's why today you can set up a, a cluster at the group level let's say and then at the group level uh every project under that group can deploy to that cluster so yeah kind of like that we had a conversation with tori yesterday about the custom was it the custom charts uh no, it was the S customization of the charts, or was it the SSL for serverless? I think it was the SSL, and she was saying that you can do it. You can provide on the cluster level, and 
yeah, we were discussing what if you run two projects on the same cluster and you don't want the same cluster configuration across the same the two projects. Oh, then you're SOL. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. You have to start a second cluster, I guess. Well, yeah, I, I, I guess that I couldn't envision a way where the configuration can be different per project. There's only one cluster configuration. I think I lost you again. Okay, you're back. No, you're not. Maybe we should um, go back to no video. I don't know. Okay, you're back. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this conversation is a lost you again. Okay, stop it. I can't hear you, but I, I see that you stopped your video. Maybe restarting the modem is not seeming like such a bad idea now. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. And I can see you too. Okay, let's see. After our call, I'm going to call them and I'm going to be very strict, which is important. <laughs> Hello? Hey, you're back. I think I spoke too soon. I just heard you say uh, hello and then you cut out. Yeah, I was saying that maybe restarting the modem doesn't seem like such a bad idea. I don't know if you heard that. I don't know if you can hear this. I think it's going to. Um, can you hear me? You're back, yes. I can hear you. Now I can't. I could hear you just for a second now, but I went went away. Okay, you're back. I heard some noise in the background. I must hear you. Resume recording. Because I'm relying on the recording also to extract whatever I miss. Okay. 
And then the number of invocations slash volume. Yes. Then the cost of my application. Well, yeah, that's not the cost so much of the application, but the cost of the resources uh, being used by my application. But maybe since, you, you know, this is part of your Kubernetes cluster, um, mm -hmm. that's more, uh, I, I, that feels to me more of a concern for an operator than a developer. Right, okay. So the I'm gonna part. strike that out from here and add it as the next item. And then monitor uh, the capacity, number of resources but that, that's covered in the first one. It's the same one, right? Which one? The, um, we had monitor how large the application Yeah, that's, that's the resources, that's the number one. Okay. Uh, then there were some log related things, right? Uh, that we were discussing yesterday. Yes, so there's, um, it's part of your ser serverless, uh, um, you know, the, the part of the scenario where logs become relevant is where um, when I come across a problem, or when one of my users comes across a problem and I want to troubleshoot for the root cause, I want to access the logs for my, my application. Is that a dev again? Oh yeah, that's definitely a dev. So when a user... So whenever, yeah, when a user of my application uh, encounters an error or encounters a problem, rather, I want to um, access the logs of my application so I can find and solve the root cause of the problem. So this is specifically related to um, a specific way of uh, deploying like other DevOps or serverless or anything else or would you say it's a general job to be done? Yeah, that's a general job to be done. I guess in the serverless space it's um, it's just like any other space. So it is, yeah, you're right. It's, that's a general developer job. Just with, with serverless, like there's very specific functionality that we want to provide in order mm -hmm. to make that easy that, you know, uh, we may have or developers may do in a different way for a regular non-serverless app. So for a serverless app, it's a bit different. Right, so what- But in, in the general, high level nature is the same. Okay, that you want to check the logs to tackle a problem, to troubleshoot basically a problem, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, is it something we have at the moment or not? Um, it's something that a user can do, but yeah, we don't, like we don't make it easier for them. We want to, but we don't currently. Yeah. I hear you. Okay. Um, let's see. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, eight, nine. I think 10, 11 jobs for a dev or 12. Um, shall we focus on the operator for the rest? Let me see. Um, you, can you think of something? Uh... Yeah, so for chat ops, uh, definitely that's, um, well, I guess both. So a developer uses chat ops for things like turning feature flags on or off, mm -hmm. uh, or uh, also to um, like get a telemetry of some kind. Like you may have a chat ops job that's returning the number of, you know, uh, the number of users or is returning some data. So that's all in the chat up space and that, yeah, that's very much geared for both operators and developers. So maybe we could, one chat ops job could be as a developer. Uh, oh, I just got your Slack. <laughs> Oh. That's saying I'll go for restarting the modem. Hopefully it doesn't take ages. That probably means your laptop is back online. Let's see. Okay. Trying. There you are. Um, okay. 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 
see how it goes. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So I, I, I was saying as a developer, um, I want to use chat ops to enable slash disable a feature flag. Let's just keep it simple. To enable disable a feature. A feature flag. flag. What does that flag mean? Just um, so basically when you um, deploy a feature that you think that it's maybe not 100% re uh, ready and you don't know how it's going to behave with the rest of the application, you put a flag in front of the, of, of the feature. So having that flag is basically just having a configuration setting that allows you to turn the feature on or off. So let's say if you find out that this feature is causing problems, you turn the flag off. That's what a feature flag is. It's right. just basically functionality to hide a feature uh, behind the flag so it doesn't impact users in a negative way. Gotcha, okay. So as a developer or operator, no, this would be more a developer. Well, I, I guess in some edge cases it could be an operator, but it's mostly a developer. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to stick to the developer then. And okay. then you said um, use chat ops for um, telemetry, right? Yeah, to get telemetry uh, from my application. So, so let's say um, you have a job that returns the number of users or the number of daily active users, let's say and you run that as a chat ops job. Uh, so, I mean, a, a lot of people will use dashboard for that too, but let's say that you're troubleshooting something and you don't have a dashboard that tells you like how much memory or CPU you're using, but you have a chat ops job that uh, gives you that, then you'll use the chat ops job. Um, mm. but yeah, I, 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 I guess the main thing you're doing is you're running a CI job through chat ops. Uh, so we can just keep the first one and may, or repurpose it uh, but that kind of also serves for an operator. So as a developer, I want to run a CI job via chat ops. That's like the more so general more job to be done. And enable a feature, even though yes. it's useful to have a more specific uh, task, I guess. Yeah, specificity is good for sure. And I think that I was thinking about the one with the feature flag, and that means, let's say if you were testing that job, you would have to build the feature flag first, and then build a chat ops job and then fire the chat ops job. So would the users of GitLab write their own chat ops uh, implementations and we would offer templates? Yes. Right, okay. And we would so, offer features out of the box that most users would want and they would have to integrate or not? With chat um, so we offer kind of the building blocks. So we offer the ability to set it up, but you have to build your own jobs. You have to configure it. You have to do all of those things. We could do that in well, any It's not project. out of the box. Yeah. You can do that in any project. Okay. Uh, and then could we use a, a run book that would be spun up every time we want chat ops to <laughs> send something? Just trying to combine our features in one story, if there is one story, or is there multiple stories? Understand how? Yeah, I think that chat ops is uh, exclusively via a chat client like Slack or Mattermost. Yeah. Run books, I would say, yeah, it doesn't fall in line with the chat ops story. Okay, so a run book couldn't um, fire like a chat ops. Uh, it could, but it would be kind of redundant. Okay. Could be um, a different way you mean from the, your code rather than your code communicating to a run book and then run book initiating a chat ops. Right. Like you, if, if you're configuring your run book to do something in CI, you will do it right in the run book. You wouldn't do like this calls a chat ops jobs that then call CI. You would probably just skip the chat client step and just do it directly from the run book. Okay. Okay, so I would use chat ops to either run a generic CI job or to, let's say, enable disable a feature flag. Uh, 
anything else? I think that's good for, for now. Uh, I was thinking about runbook scenarios for developers, but that's really more geared towards an operator. I mean, the only, yeah, yeah, it's just more for an operator. Okay. Um, we need to also prioritize. So maybe a couple more or, I don't know, as many as we can figure out in four minutes and then we can use the rest of the time to prioritize. Um, okay, but are we talking specifically for developers or do we want to switch to an operator now? Because we haven't talked about operators at all. We want to switch to an operator and... Okay. <laughs> I feel that we could talk for another hour just about operators. Um, but uh, yeah, let's let's start and we'll get as far as we, we can get. Um, so in the world of auto DevOps, I could see an operator uh, that is in charge of building an application development platform. So you know how every company has a team that is the platform team and they give developers the environments to deploy to and like test environments and, and they're in charge of building that for their own developers. Site so, mm. how, sorry. Are they, how are they called in our case? You generally call them a platform team. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so the platform team is generally the one building the platform where developers are going to deploy to. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, so um, when that, that has kind of two parts. One part is uh, infrastructure. So in the old days, you would like set up a ton of VMs and then you know scale them as needed, hopefully with some elastic service. Um, and that kind of has switched now to uh, Kubernetes clusters. So the first part is that I set up uh, a, a Kubernetes cluster, but the second part is that I, I may want to provide some automated way to build and deploy your, your project, and that could be auto DevOps. So as an operator, I want to use auto DevOps um, as an automated way for developers to deploy their projects or for developers to build, test, and deploy their projects. So that would be a decision from the upside uh to build well th that's um yeah when we talk about the decision it's uh I, I guess um kind of a joint effort because developers could very well say i don't want to use this automated feature i want to build my own i want to build my own pipeline hmm. because i don't know x you know whatever reason i don't trust uh this pipeline. Yeah, just developers are difficult and be very <laughs> contrarian yeah okay so um, that's the main job as an operator, I want to use auto DevOps for to allow developers to build, test, and deploy their projects. Yes. Other things that for an operator, um, as an operator, I want to, um, I want to. Well, so around uh, Kubernetes, I can think about multiple things. One is creating a, a new uh, Kubernetes cluster and attach it to uh, an instance, group, or project. The second job is add an existing cluster to an instance, group, or project. Um, the second thing, or yeah, I guess the third thing as an operator would be, as an operator, I want to deploy a Helm chart into my in uh, into my Kubernetes cluster. Or you could, you I guess we don't have to be as specific. Uh, we can say I want to deploy an application to my Kubernetes cluster. Could it be an application I have written, other than an operator? Um. So yeah, I guess that we should differentiate between application and Helm chart because when we're talking about a Helm chart is yeah it's the kind of the one click uh things that we do so let, you know, let's call it helm chart because as an operator you wouldn't deploy an application it would be a developer that that, that de deploys an application so as an operator i want to deploy helm chart to my kubernetes cluster yes um you also want to uninstall a Helm chart that you have previously installed. 
Um, and you also want to update a chart that you have pre previously uh, installed. Specifically Helm or any chart in this, in this last two case, I want to uninstall. And... It's yeah, it's all charts. It's all Helm charts. Oh, this is, okay, so Helm is an umbrella. So Helm is, is um, a package manager. Um, uh, and the, package, the packages for Kubernetes are called charts. Uh, and they are Helm charts. Um, so let's say Knative is a Helm chart. Uh, the runner is a Helm chart. And, and these are like it, apps, it, right? But wrapped yeah, in this. They are like apps. They are like apps just in the Kubernetes world. They are called charts but it's just an app, yeah. So Helm is the package manager and what it manages, so the currency that it deals in, those apps are called charts. So as an operator, I want to uh, install Helm charts. One of them is Helm, so uh, uh, confusingly enough, it's like very confusing that Helm chart is called Helm. And there's another Helm chart called Ingress. There's another Helm chart called uh, you know, runner. So there's all, all of these as an operator, I want to install them Cube on Monkey. my cluster. It's also going to be a chart, right? Sorry? CubeMonkey? CubeMonkey is also going to be a, a chart, yes. The chart is a specific way of packaging and running your uh, specific application specifically for uh, containers. For Kubernetes specifically, okay. not not for for containers. Yeah. Okay. So th there are like multiple ways that you can deploy something into Kubernetes, and Helm just makes it easy. It's a package manager, so like every application is bundled as a chart, and you can use Helm to install it. Uh, otherwise, you would have to do it manually, and that's like a ton of work. Yeah. So it's just something that makes it easier. So you can also write your own Helm chart and. Yes, so we do that with Auto DevOps. We, uh, the code that you write in your application, we make it into a Helm chart and we deploy it to the cluster. All right, okay. Okay, so I missed the last job. Too. So I'm left and I want to uninstall a Helm chart that I previously installed. And then you mentioned one more. I want to upgrade or update a Helm chart that I have previously installed. <laughs> Um, okay, and what would be the job around the, the conf custom configuration of um, charts? So, the job would be, as an operator, I want to change or I want to customize the default values for a GitLab provided Helm chart before I install it on my cluster. Or, so the GitLab provided are the charts we have under uh, in this. Uh, in, the, in the GitLab managed apps page. Under creating the cluster, we have the installation of the charts. These are all the GitLab created charts. Those are the GitLab uh, provided charts. And n currently they're all hard coded. Uh, not hardcore. So currently they're not customizable. Uh, they're just a static chart file that you we deploy into your cluster. But let's say if you wanted to change a policy or you wanted to not use the defaults, you currently have no way of doing that. Yeah. So as an operator, I want to customize the chart before I install it into my cluster. So before I install it? Yes, prior and to installation. You customize it and then you, you, you install it. What if I want to customize, where did my, my camera keep switching off? I think it's my instability. So <laughs> would a job to be done be, I want to customize and already installed. So I'm gonna customize yeah. it. You can't customize something that's already installed. Okay. Something that's already installed, it's already uh, installed. If you want to customize it, I guess you could, you would have to redeploy it. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, so, But in, in the GitLab world, we don't provide a way to do that, uh, nor should we. So uh, in, in that scenario, the best thing to do would be to uninstall it, customize it, and install it. 
Okay. What if you're running an application? Would you have to duplicate your project, customize in the new project, the charts, deploy, and then, sorry. I don't know the right words. So let's say you have a project and you want, you, it's running, it's live, but you want to customize for some reason, something in the K-native, if that's a thing. Uh, so in order to not have downtime, you would have to duplicate the project, customize. Well, not, not really. So uh, Kubernetes has this great way of doing upgrades without downtime, where you can, you, you have several pods, right? So you have one pod that will be serving your, your, your app, and then you spin up another pod with all the upgraded stuff. And then when that's live, then you take down the prior pod and you can do that without da uh, downtime. So you wouldn't need a second cluster. You just need a, a new pod, let's say. And you yes. would run pods at once and then you would take down uh, the old one and use only the new one. Is yeah, this is all done automatically for you. You don't have to specify that. Like uh, Kubernetes takes care of that. And for charts, is it something we can do? But I guess not. Yeah. It is. Yeah, it is. So, so currently, we allow you to upgrade, and that's without downtime. Um, so, and what we're doing is basically just redeploying the chart. So, in this new way that we customize, and we're going to uh, deploy the charts via CI, you're going to be able to like change the values of your chart and redeploy it without downtime. So would that be the same job as I want to upgrade uh, a Helm chart? Would it also be upgrade means customize as well, maybe, or change, edit? I, I, I would, yeah, I would say it's a separate job. And I would say as an operator, I want to change the configuration of my deployed Helm chart and redeploy it. And that's something we don't have today, but we'll have, like Tong is, is uh, working on that right now. And redeploy without down, downtime. Yes, I, I, I guess you, you can add that specificity, but uh, as I said, Kubernetes takes care of that for you. Uh, as long as you're using the same chart, if you're using a different chart, then you would have to uninstall it. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, we're over time. I don't know how we managed to do that. Uh, oh, well, I mean, we had a bit of connection problems. So. Yeah. It's reasonable. Yes. It's perfect now. Yeah. So it must be something with the modem. I don't know. Probably. I need to buy a new cable maybe myself. Um, okay. Do you want to, maybe I will document all these jobs in an issue and then we can work asynchronously to prioritize them. And then maybe we can add. Yeah. So we're not done with the jobs for the operator, but do, do you want to stop there? Like we have a lot more stuff in this section that, if you have uh, it's re relevant for an operator. If you have time, I can keep going. For, uh, uh, it's up to you. You don't have to, uh, but like we, 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 we could set up another session. It's up to session. you, actually, because you're the base. Yeah, I, I, I can keep going until 11, so like 10 more, 10 more minutes. Let's do 10 more minutes and see what we can get done. Uh, okay. So let's talk about, let's keep talking about Kubernetes. So as an operator, um, I want to see the number of deployments that have been made to the cluster. So let's say I'm an operator. I am setting up uh, an application development platform for the development teams. I want to monitor the cluster to make sure that it's sized um, appropriately. And how I do that is looking at two things. One is the number of deployments. And the second is the number of resources being used. So as an operator, I, I want to see the number of deployments that they have been made to the cluster. The second job is as an operator, I want to see the number of resources being used by a Kubernetes cluster at any given time. There was a similar job for a developer, correct? Uh, I don't think so, no. Uh, the number of resources. Well, yeah, so the capacity being used by my application, yeah. But so we're not talking about a single application now. Now we're talking about cluster wide. Let's say I set up a gigantic uh, cluster for the, for the development teams. In order to make sure that it's sufficient, I have to monitor that, 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 that cluster. And one of the things that I do is I 
I could see like CPU memory being used and stuff like that, but I also want to see the resources in use, like how many pods are deployed to this cluster currently. And if, you, if I see it's a million and it's a small cluster, then I probably have to think about re resizing it. Uh, that sort of thing, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Resizing. Is that a thing that they would like to do via GitLab? Like after they monitor uh, to resize a cluster that has projects running? Or do you need to spin up a new cluster? No, you 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 can resize in place. Uh, like all the cloud providers allow you to do that. It's an interesting question if you want to do that via GitLab because we would have to implement that specifically for every cloud provider. So like so, I, it's not something that I would pursue unless we had a very strong reason or a very strong sentiment from the user that the tools being provider uh, provided by their cloud providers are not enough. Uh, because that's the kind of thing you generally would go to your cloud provider to do. Like you would log in to the dashboard and you would resize it there. It'd be great if we could do it via, via GitLab, but you know, currently I don't think that we have a lot of appetite from yeah. operators to do that. Do you think there is a job that I come and want to see all my clusters regardless of who's the provider? Like, just yeah. get you have my project how many clusters are running regardless of if it's a AWS or a, um, a Kubernetes or... Yeah, so we have that today, yeah, sure. So then if I need to resize one, not caring about what it is, but just say resize to these resources and then we take care of everything at the background for you. Like Yeah, it, I mean, it would be a nice nice to, to have, but currently I don't have... Yeah, I'm just asking no, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, jobs. Okay, so we already have. Was that the screen you showed yesterday? The tiles of uh, your cluster resources. That was. Uh, the no. So currently, so yeah, I guess I should rephrase that. Currently, you can see all the clusters that you have configured at a certain level. So let's say, uh, if I log in, and I see my instance level, I can see all the clusters that are provisioned at my instance level. If I go to a group, I can see all the clusters that have been uh, configured for that group. If I go to a project, so on and so forth. But I can't have a mix of all three, so maybe that's something that uh, we should think about. But um, yeah, funny enough, we don't really have um, like any request to do that currently because, as I said, that's the kind of job that you would do in the cloud providers um, system. Yeah. Well, sometimes people don't ask for things because they are not available yet. Uh, sure. Or yeah, because they have another way of doing it. And so the, 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 there's like a fine line there because we, we are the complete tool for the DevOps lifecycle, but we are not an infrastructure provider, right? So we don't provide clusters or VMs for you. We allow you to manage them. Uh, but so like how many features do we want to build that a cloud provider all, already provides? keeping in mind that we're not an, uh, an like a compute provider. Yeah, that's what I would qualify that. That's what I thought from you, the conversation so far, that we cannot integrate all the functionality that is provided. Right. Now, with that being said, if that, if we have like strong appetite from a user that says, hey, it would be great that I could see all the clusters across all of my uh, layers in one place, we could certainly you know, uh, take that and run with it. But so far we haven't had that. Yeah, yeah in, so if we're, I'm eating the time, but I think it's also a very valuable conversation. If we don't want to integrate the functionality, we need to decide what we want to be basically in this space because we are integrating with external functionality. We want to be a monitoring so that they don't have to jump in any cloud provider so that they go to a centralized place. You know, like, sure have your news from separate newspapers, right? I'm annoyed to go to each newspaper and then see what's interesting and what's not. I would like everything gathered in one screen. Uh, so I'm kind of thinking we could be that or we could be the integration and provide functionality, which is a duplicate. But I think it's more possible to become the place for it. like a uh, white paper. Uh, I don't know how you call it. Um, yeah, like uh, Google News and an aggregator. Yeah, I don't care which 
provider this cluster is from. I just know that the health is not okay and I can fix some things um, or I can take action or you can take me as GitLab to the provider without me having to manually uh, type anything. So um, yeah, I think it would be nice like a centralized log, a centralized dashboard for all your projects and then you can in. Uh, but yeah, it's very early days yet to start. Sure, but yeah, that's, I, I, I think definitely a worthwhile com conversation to have is how much do we build? Cool. Okay. Okay, operators, and two more minutes. Um, so yeah, I think that for Kubernetes, uh, we could leave it there. Um, I, I mean, we talked about the monitoring of, of the cluster, but that's outside of configure. That's another stage. So we could keep it relevant to this stage. Another job is that I want to, as, a, as an operator, I want to configure um, the base DNS domain for my cluster. I, I, I think that that's one that, that you mentioned. Um, let's go. Yeah. We already talked about apps. Uh, yeah, so another one would be, we talked about pod logs, we, talked, we haven't talked about web terminals. Um, but as an operator, um, I want to log in uh, to a web terminal um, from a container that's running in my cluster. So I can like issue commands, and maybe troubleshoot issues and so on. You all already have the jobs of creating a new cluster and also adding an existing cluster, right? Yeah, these ones exist already. Okay. Um, but maybe it's part, if I don't have a cluster, it will be part of another job potentially. I don't know. I think the, um, the K-native one would include it. The K-native one wouldn't be what, sorry? Maybe it would be included in the, as a developer, I want to focus on just uh, deploying my, my code without worrying about the infrastructure or without having to configure the infrastructure. So this could uh, include also the creation. Sure. But yeah, that's true. Um, all right. So I think that we're at time, but so we only got to the second category, which is Kubernetes configuration, but we have a lot more jobs to be done for an operator. So maybe it's worth like chatting about it a bit more yeah. before we start uh, refining. Okay, cool. I'll schedule something for next, uh, I'll see when you have some time. Uh, okay, cool. We can continue hopefully with a better connection. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool, sounds good. Thank, thanks for doing this, this is really great. Uh, so I, I'm, 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 I'm excited to put them all in one place and refine them. Yeah, I think I can also add them to the doc I created for personas and uh, user stories. I think it's gonna, okay. So, thank you for giving uh, your valuable time. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you, Maria. Alrighty. See you later. Ha have a nice weekend. Bye bye. Bye.